You know, over the last 10 years, I've spent a lot of time chasing a lot of prototypes in Colorado, trying to figure out what it is and what it's going to be. And today, we get to pull back the veil on what it takes to develop the brand new 2020 C8 Corvette, because this may look like a Holden, but it's not. Let me explain by having a chat with the guy responsible for the development of the new Corvette Stingray. So we're here to talk about a Holden, which mm -hmm. it really isn't a Holden. You're the development engineer on the new C8 Corvette. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of let's walk through the development process because we spend a lot of time in Colorado chasing you guys. So we see a lot of these cars out there, but let's start with this one. Uh, to me, it looks like a Holden, but really, what is it? Yeah, so I mean, if maybe first we do a glance across. Yeah, so let's we, do it. we earliest development mule all the way up through the production vehicle. So we see four different stages here in front of us. And this particular vehicle is a, a one of one. So we codenamed this vehicle Blackjack because okay. within the company, um, as we started working on this, we kind of wanted to keep the fact that we were working on something that was a mid-engine product secretive, obviously outside, but even inside, because as we involve more folks, there's more opportunity or potential for uh, leaks and so on to start to study what does it take for GM to do a high-performance mid-engine vehicle. We started with the thing that you don't see here, which is hundreds of thousands of hours, man hours, of computer-aided engineering. So was this like seven years ago that we're talking? Yeah, yeah, yeah a little, even before that, oh, honestly, wow. yeah. Um, and this product kind of, or, or this particular car kind of came online when we were launching C7, we, we built this car. So why'd you use a Holden? So this was a very convenient clown suit. So okay. as we start to look at uh, how do I camouflage the fact that there's a, a mid-engine you know, vehicle that we're trying to study here, traditional camouflage like you see on the other development vehicles don't hide anything. So we thought it'd be neat to try to hide the engine underneath a truck kind of layout. So a Holden Ute had a very convenient shape and we tried to emulate that shape. But if you look at the details of this car, the only things that are Holden specific are, we pulled the headlamps from a, a Holden vehicle, the front fascia is from a Holden, the mirrors and the tail lamps. Everything else body panel wise is completely handmade. Um, the interior of the vehicle is straight out of a C7. The electronics straight out of a C7. So we, we basically took an old C7 development vehicle, took the parts off of it that we needed, roof, glass, windshield, because I wanted to be able to seal things up and so on, uh, and then everything else is handmade. So what's unique about this car is I have no donor for the body structure. So um, if you look in here, we have abundance of billet machined components. So this car, the components of the car, the body structure, started with 7,000 pounds of billet. And we turned about 90% of that into recycled chips. But every piece of uh, billet material that's on this vehicle was machined at a GM facility. What's the uh, power plant, is it? It's an LT1 from that donor development vehicle. Um, and it's also tied to a um, ZF DCT. So we purchased a DCT from uh, 918. Um, mated it with a custom machine bell housing um, and then we we worked with ZF to make a GM electronics talk to Porsche transmission. Would, would it be fair to say that this is the world's most expensive Corvette? Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it feels like it's all hand-built. Yeah, yeah, if you if you add people time into that, that that's probably a fair assessment. <laughs> so so what, what kind of stage of development is this on your timeline? So this is like pre-mule. This okay. is basically really early on in the um, even post-target setting kind of thing. So like, proof how do I- concept kind of? Uh, yeah. Probably one step beyond that. Because oh, proof okay. of concept I always think about like is more design based. Yep. So this would be like engineering proof of concept based is probably what And what did say. you do with it? Did you take this on the track or did you take it on the road or both? Both. Both, okay. Yeah, I mean, it, was, it stayed on GM facilities, yep. obviously, because we wanted to try to hide what we were doing. Uh, we did a lot of work at night with this vehicle to try to keep exposure down. We did a lot of work at our desert proving grounds because that's um, it's on a military facility, so uh, the access is quite a bit lower and so on. So what's it like to drive? It, it's pretty awesome, is actually. It yeah, it, it, it's interesting to see the things that we learned in this, how they've carried through into the other uh, in newer products. Like, what does it take to make 
a mid-engine car ride good? What, what, what's a Stingray want to be in the mid-engine layout? That's what the configuration of this car is right now. And those learnings transferred very well into what we're seeing in the production vehicle. Well, that seems like a perfect segue yeah. to go to the next one. Now these are the ones that you know we're chasing on the road. So is this the next one? Is so yeah, so this is what we would cons we would call an architectural mule. So this yep. is a one of one yep. over here. Yep. We built eleven of these. Okay. So now so in this stage, um, we built vehicles that we never drove. So five of these vehicles immediately got crashed because we needed to make sure that we had an anchor point for all those hours and hours of um, uh, CAE barrier assessments, crash assessments. But we needed to make sure that as a world car that this thing could meet all the requirements uh, around the globe. And this first round of vehicles was to, to confirm that we had the bones to do that. We needed to learn about integration of the new electrical architecture, integration of uh, the transmission. Now this vehicle has the first iteration of uh, the Tremec GM co-developed transmission. Uh, and then it, it, you know the stuff that's in our space, vehicle dynamics related and so on like now that. How closely are you working with the designers at this point? Because now obviously this has a new Corvette shape already, so you've got the... Yes and no. Okay. So like if we didn't have the camo on here, you'd see lots of C7 stuff on oh, here. Oh, okay. Windshield's still C7, roof's still C7, glasses C7, doors are C7. We have a boxy hand-built front end, but the proportions are correct. Okay. So everything underneath here, the body structure, you know, wheelbase, track width, that sort of thing is, is all... Um, is all the new car. You look in the interior, this is a super Spartan interior. It's all function. How about the power plant as well? So this is the first LT2. Okay. So we moved to LT2 yep. with a Tremec 8-speed DCT for the first time. So, um, you know, when you're not crashing them, right, but when you're actually <laughs> driving them, what are you learning from, from this stage of development? What's kind of the goal and what are kind of the, the ticks that you're ticking off on the, on the to-do list? So this is kind of, I'm still in the super basic stages. Okay. If you think about like development as a big funnel, yep. right? So I'm still in a really wide edge of the funnel right now. Because this car has a body structure that has uh, high pressure die castings in it, it has the actual design. There's new things that I learned about structure targets. There's new things I learned about vehicle dynamics, tuning items, um, what can I get away with with spring rates, stuff like that. Uh, that I have to relearn now that I've got a new backbone of the car um, in the so, new body So how structure. many engineers at this point are working on the project at GM? At, at this point, we're in the hundreds. I mean, it's getting bigger right now. Yeah, that skunk works, we're in the couple hundred okay. engineers at this point. And then when we move to what we, you guys would maybe consider a more traditional prototype, which yeah. is this next vehicle. Yeah, let's go over there. Let's move so, over this one. Eleven cars built here. Yep. Um, over a hundred okay. built here. So th this is the the Ivers that you saw, uh, or integration vehicles that you've seen on the road. Now I have a lot more to learn. You see a, a, a real interior in this vehicle. You see real panels on it. Um, you see everything's in the right place. So I have to do full development of the vehicle. Um, in, in all areas, whether it's starting to learn about squeaks and rattles for um, interior components and that sort of thing, final development integration tuning, we crashed more cars, you know, we crashed over 30 vehicles in this stage. Engine calibration, trans calibration, how those things work together. At this point, how far are you from actual production when you're with this prototype? Uh, about a year. About a year, okay. Yeah. So now mm -hmm. you've got the thumbs up and it's all... All systems go, go. yeah. And exactly. how many engineers are working at this point? I mean, now it's probably... Thousand. Got thousand, thousand or more, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right, what was it like to kind of go from driving that one to this one to this one? I mean, was there a real um, learning curve or is that the beginning of this? Do you know, is this a natural evolution? Is this what you were going for the whole time? Total natural progression, okay. yeah. Yeah, because everything we learned carried through and then all the other parts of the car just got better okay. along with it and the big thing that our team does is that integration of the parts thing you know so like we want all the components and all the systems to work in harmony to give you that awesome driving experience and that's what our team does so so what's it feel like to finally you know get behind the wheel of this guy after you spent all this time getting to here yeah, uh, honestly, my aha moment yeah. was when we left the Nurburgring last year in July and we had completed that 
you know, 729.9. And, and we left that trip and my guys emailed all their calibrations back, final calibrations. And we got on the plane and it was like, we're done. We did it. We did it. Have you crashed Super this, satisfying. these as well? We, we have, yeah. yeah, we've done, not but most, many. Most of yours has been done. Yeah, okay. so like in this stage yep. here, we do final validation, performance okay. validation. That, that's everything from certifying max lat numbers to crashing cars to make sure that we meet government certifications and that sort of thing. But we have to do some confirmation work in Bowling Green built vehicles as well. And when you started the program, did you have performance numbers that you were targeting? I mean, the numbers for the car are pretty astounding, right? It's uh, 0 to under three seconds, top speed of 194, I think it's what, over 1G lateral. Mm -hmm. uh, were those numbers on your computer when you first started? Yes. Okay. Before that car. So that, that's where you start. Is, right. is, uh, you know, and that's the tough thing is with a car like this, you're a completely blank sheet of paper. Yeah. So where do you start? Start with, okay, what, what, where, does, where do we need to position the car from a performance perspective, price perspective, content perspective? We started with what do we need to learn? So okay. like we, we did a lot of benchmarking in the mid-engine segment because there, we knew there were things that we didn't that we had to go learn that we didn't know necessarily. So like you said, we benchmarked a lot of Ferraris, Porsches, McLaren, you know, and, and we looked at certain aspects of, of uh, those cars, not necessarily them holistically, because some of the Ferraris are way beyond what we're trying to achieve with a Stingray or a Z51, right. but there's things to learn from each one of those, and, and we targeted specifically the items that we wanted to look at. Yeah, what was your favorite stage in the development? Yeah. Uh, geez. Um, probably the transition from this car being validated to now the what the customer is going to see touch and feel and it, it, i mean that was like the the confirmation of years in the making uh super satisfying and so for sure seeing these things out on the road has uh, been the, the best part of this all one. right last question and i think it's an obvious one are you going to buy one <laughs> how could you not yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know what's crazy Seven to eight years ago, I had no idea that the C7 was coming, let alone this mid-engine C8. It just goes to show you how long it takes to develop a car, especially a car as important as the Corvette, from birth all the way to, well, showroom. Thanks for watching, guys, and check out tflcar.com for more news views and, of course, behind-the-scenes development reviews. See you guys next time. Ciao.